great attitude that he has. This will serve as the final lesson that I'm doing in the series of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how many lessons we've had total now, probably somewhere eight, nine, or ten. I didn't count them all as we started this a couple of months ago. And I enjoy doing this, and I appreciate so much uh, that I've got a lot of positive feedback from various members. And not only that, but just recently got some feedback through YouTube because I just want to remember, remind everybody that now, and Stuart's just doing a great job, that since we're able to do this, it's kind of an interesting perspective if you ever go and watch the YouTube sermons now from here because of the close proximity of this. And I just got to always make sure my nose is clean. That's all I can tell you. <clears throat> I don't mean to be insensitive about that, but still, it's kind of a close proximity. But what is nice is able to see in the YouTube now are able to see the PowerPoints, the slides, and that's good. And actually got uh, some feedback that somebody went online and uh, saw or listened to a part of the series in the Holy Spirit. And the feedback was that they were very, very uh, pleased and happy to hear the information and they found it to be quite helpful. So you just never know. It's another, it's another aspect or medium that we're able to use communication-wise that we can reach out to people. And so I think it's a real blessing that we're able to do this. I'd rather talk and see people live, see them in the pews, but it's, it is a blessing. As we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, and what I want to close with and make some final observations and applications is that the beautiful promise that has been given to us by God and that's recorded in his word, and as we have sung this evening, give me the Bible, that's what we're dealing with. What does the Bible say about this and any other topic or subject that is important to us? but that Christians have been promised by God that we would be given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of salvation and as a pledge to a ultimate, final, heavenly reward. And the language is very, very interesting to me of how this is stated. I want us to look at some passages, and we're just going to read them, and I want to give their... Brief context, but if you'll take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul, reminding the church at Corinth of the work that God has done through the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. But you're going to see something very fascinating in verse 21 when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now you're going to notice in verse 21 there are two pronouns, and those two pronouns are us. Now he who establishes us, and then he'll say again, and has anointed us. Make no mistake that the first us is talking about Paul and the apostles, because us he says, with you, the Corinthians, in Christ. But most all of the scholars and the commentaries are in agreement that while the first us refers to definitely Paul and the apostles who are guided by the Holy Spirit, filled with the, by the Holy Spirit, and are able to know all truth because of the Holy Spirit, that while that definitely refers to Paul and the apostles, that the second us seems to be much more generic into all Christians. And as it's used again, the pronoun is used in verse 22, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. There's nothing in the Greek that we can look at that and say, oh yes, well that has to be. Context is going to demand it. And I want to tell you why I believe that the second us in verse 21 and the two us's in verse 22 are going to refer to all Christians in general. And it is because of the agreement that this passage will have specifically with a couple of other passages or cross-references that will teach and say the same thing in which it's very clear that it wasn't just talking about apostles, but all Christians. And because of the agreement between these passages, both, by the way, all these passages all penned, written by the Apostle Paul, I think it helps us to come to the conclusion of why 
the many scholars and commentators have come to the conclusion of why this is a promise, this is a guarantee that has been given to all Christians. You would notice over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if we just flip a few pages, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to note verse 5 in particular, but in order to get the context of this, we're going to read all eight verses in second, the first eight verses, I should say, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and this is the situation where Paul is reminding the Corinthians, he's reminding the Christians that we are presently in a physical tent, a tabernacle, that's our body. But he's going to use this analogy that the time is coming that this tent of this tabernacle, it is going to be done away with in death. But then we're going to be clothed upon again in resurrection. That's the context of these eight verses in chapter 5. And this is something that's not just promised to the apostles. It's promised to all Christians, you'll see. Verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, uh, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Just stop there for a moment. As Christians, we long for that. You're, you're all here in your present tabernacle, your present tent. And that's your physical body. We're living, right? Is this tent going to be destroyed? Yes, it will be by virtue of death and this physical body is going to return to the dust from whence it came, correct? But the promise is that we're going to be clothed upon again. And that, of course, will take place in the resurrection and then be able to inherit a heavenly home. And we look forward to that. And we know in the teaching of 1 Corinthians 15 and even in the teaching of 1 John 3 that this being clothed upon again, that we're going to receive a glorious body and one that pleases God. So if you don't like your body, you don't like this physical tent, well, you know what? That's not what's going to heaven anyway because 1 Corinthians 15 also teaches that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. We're going to be changed. And this is what Paul's talking about. Now let's read on. In verse 4. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. You know, we're not with the Lord in heaven right now. But don't we want to be someday? Don't we? For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And so when you look at verse 5, verse 5, he says there that he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who also has given this us the Spirit as a guarantee. And, and I'll tell you, no one is going to suggest that the us there refers just to the apostles. This is all Christians. And yet this is almost the exact same thing that he stated back in chapter 1. Again, where we were first in 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Do you see how in both passages the Spirit has been given as a guarantee? Do you all see that? Then go to Ephesians chapter 1, please. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And to further validate this point, Paul writing now to the church at Ephesus, to these Christians. And in verse 13, in Him, that is in Christ, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, this is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. After you've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit serves as what is a guarantee. Three times. 
We see Paul using this same word, by the way, as we're going to study in just a moment. Then if you'll flip over a page or two to chapter 4 in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And Paul warns the brethren in Ephesus. Very important warning. It's an admonition. When he says to them in Ephesians 4 and verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And there's that sealing aspect again. There are two significant words in all of these texts that we've read in 2 Corinthians and Ephesians that are very germane to our study. And when we look at this word guarantee to begin with, and we have this Greek word erebon, which is a rarity because as a matter of fact, this doesn't happen very often, but the Greek word in fact comes from a Hebrew word here in its etymology, which is kind of an unusual thing. Because Erebon in Hebrew, Aragon in Greek, sound almost the same. And it's a very interesting word because originally an Erebon was, it was earnest money deposited by a purchaser. In fact, there are there is some literature in classical literature where it was used, for example, of a particular woman who was going to buy a substantial amount of property field, and she paid, as it were, a down payment, a pledge of so many drachma, an amount of money. And yet, while that was the down payment of the pledge, she was promising, it was like a promise that I will come up with the rest of the money, but this was to hold it. Well, kind of like when we put a down payment and then it's going to go into escrow and so forth and all that. And then it was something that was promised. And what's interesting that the purchaser, the way this word was used, that it was de deposited by the purchaser, but it was forfeited if the purchase was not completed. In fact, you lose your money. You don't want to do that, right? Somebody says, I put down a substantial amount of money because I'm promising this is my pledge. And they say, okay, but here's the agreement. You don't buy this and come up with the rest of the money. In today's standard, what we do, you either find a, a, you know, a, a, a box full of cash somewhere or you'll more likely go and, and finance through a bank. And you go through escrow, but can you imagine being in a situation they say, but here's the point. In an error bone, if you don't complete the sale and do not go into this agreement, you lose your down payment. But the word is used in such a way that God's making the promise, God's making the pledge, and God will fulfill his promise. And we're not, and we're not going to lose out. Do you see what I'm saying? We're not going to lose out. It came to denote a pledge or earnest, an earnest of any sort. And in the New Testament, it's interesting... Because we've looked at almost all the usages. There's just a couple of other examples I could have taken you to. But it's the same concept. In the New Testament is used only of that which is assured. It's assured by God to believers. This word in the New Testament is only used in reference to something that God has assured to believers. And you know what? God keeps his promises. I find that to be an interesting word to study. And so in today's vernacular, kind of a down payment. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a pledge, as a promise, as an earnest of ultimate salvation someday. That's how we're going to look at it. The other word that we find is the seal concept or idea. And there we have phrasgizo. Uh, very interesting because it's got one of those, starts with three consonants, those are always tough. But in phrasgizo, that we, it's, a, it's to set a seal upon, to mark with the seal, to seal something, yes. But what it does is when it was sealed, it, it, it indicates a security or a permanency to authenticate vine says. In other words, this whole deal is authenticated. It is, it's permanent. It's set. It's marked. It's sealed. You know what we might say today? Seal the deal. <laughs> okay. To seal the deal. And there it's found in 2 Corinthians 1 22, as we saw, Ephesians 1 13 and 14, Ephesians 4 30. Now, looking at these words and the way that they're used and the promise given to Christians, and I say to you again that Christians are given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of salvation 
and as a pledge of our ultimate heavenly reward. That's why we've been given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as an Erebon, guarantee, given us by God, is an analogy to indicate that the Spirit's influence in our present lives is the first installment of our heavenly reward and the guarantee of the fullness of that reward will someday be upon us. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God's token and pledge of still greater things to come. And I'll tell you, as, as many of the scholars, the lexicons will point out, is that this gift of the Holy Spirit and this promise of the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with miraculous gifts. It has everything to do with relationship. And what the Spirit does for us in this relationship. So you know all that does? It brings about the question, who has this guarantee? The Holy Spirit that we have as Christians See, it's a guarantee. But we've got to ask the question, who has this guarantee? And I want to say to you, first of all, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because we've dealt with it, but this is kind of a reiteration of much of what we've talked about. But I want to suggest to you that those who are baptized into Christ, they have the guarantee. By the way, I did this series not quite as extensive in a few of the sermons as I have done this time around. But in Cayucas, in, in March and April of 1994, uh, 20 years ago, coming up in 20 years, and this was the lesson basically that I closed with back then too. In fact, this point, I didn't quite go into Arabone and to Sfragiso quite as much. Didn't know much about it that back then, I'll be real honest to tell you. Just learning. That's when I was, I was right in the midst of one of taking Greek and Hebrew back in those years. But one thing that hasn't changed, and I'll tell you the truth never changes, and that's consistent. And I preached it 20 years ago, and I'm preaching it again now, that those who are baptized into Christ have been given that promise. And when we look at Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 41, a text that so many of you are well familiar with, but, but turn your Bibles there. In Acts chapter 2, and when Peter preaches this sermon, this powerful sermon on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem, and the first time that the gospel based upon the reality of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is preached with thousands of Jews present. And his concluding thought, statement in the sermon proper is verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. End of sermon. The immediate response of the people in verse 37 is this. Many of these Jews responded. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, pricked to the heart. They were very much moved. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, verse 38, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift, singular, relational, the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, those Jews present, to your children, other Jews to come in coming generations, to all that are afar off, most of us clearly understand that as the Gentiles, as they're identified the Gentiles are identified as the far-off people in Ephesians 2. As many as the Lord our God will call. And I submit for your consideration and understanding that the same powerful gospel preaching and conclusion of over 1,900 years ago that Peter preached to them and told them what they needed to do is still absolutely necessary today if we wish to have the remission of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We look at this, and that's the import of verses 38 and 39. The gift of the Holy Spirit. 
You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the remission of sins, which we need, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I talked about that several weeks ago, that it is a genitive. Yes, but it's a genitive of apposition. The Holy Spirit is the gift. It's not what the Holy Spirit gives. The Holy Spirit is the gift. It's appositional. And the promise, he says in verse 39, is to you and your children, to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God could call. And so as people back then accepted that, understood that, and as they repented and were baptized back then, did they receive the remission of sins? Did they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? And did they receive a promise? Yes, they did. What about those who are far off and as many as the Lord our God shall call 1,900 years later? Absolutely. That's why if you'll notice over in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, then the people are reminded of this in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. To these disciples it is said, and we are his witnesses. Look at that, Acts chapter 5 verse 32. And we are his witnesses to these things. And some, somebody else is a witness too. To all the things that have taken place, we understand what had happened, the healing of the layman in chapter 3, and the accusations, and standing before the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, and all of these things that are going on. And there are witnesses. It says, we're witnesses to these things. So also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, the question is a very simple one. Is the Holy Spirit been given to people, to those who have obeyed God? Yes, that's what it says. Who has this guarantee? Those that are baptized into Christ. Now we're going to spend some time in Romans 8, but first of all, we're going to see in Romans 8, as you turn over to Romans 8, you might, might, want, to, might, might want to just kind of camp there for a little bit. Stay there. But I want you to notice, because in chapter 7, after Paul has set up this, this whole analogy of, of, of the person outside of Christ that's struggling, and he's struggling, and he, and he knows the things that he should do, wants to do, that would please God, and he says, but yet I don't do the things that I want to do, that I know please God. And then he looks at the things and says, then there are these things that I don't want to do, I know are bad and evil, and I decide I don't want to do that, but I go ahead and do them. Remember that tug of war that's going on in chapter 7? And he talked about, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this, deliver me from this body of death. And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ your Lord. The deliverance is through Jesus Christ. Sin is a very compelling thing. Temptation and sin is an influence. It's a compelling law, as it were. And there's only one thing that can deliver us from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death, by the way? It's Ezekiel 18.20, for example. The soul that sins, it will die. That's the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? Romans 6.23, even the previous chapter was 7. In 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now when you go to chapter 8, in Romans chapter 8, that's why then Paul makes this whole argument for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you, highlight that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The soul that sins is going to die. The wage of sin is death. That's the law. That's the law. You, you know, we can't change that law. That's the law of sin and death. You sin, you die. What's the only deliverance? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Brethren and friends, hear me please. The gospel is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The powerful, saving gospel. That gospel, when they said in Acts 2, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized here. We want to be the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And as we would go through the book of Acts and see all of those cases of conversion, and we see that consistency. What did people need to do in order to have the forgiveness of sins, to be in a relationship with God, to have his spirit in that relationship? It's consistent. Believe, repent, and be baptized. We see it over and over and over and over again. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, who has this guarantee? Do we not see those baptized in Christ? And if one is not baptized, truly baptized in Christ, with the understanding, forgiveness of sins, 
the gift of the Holy Spirit, the relationship with God, and the saved body of Christ. I'm going to tell you, that's why the young children, sometimes when young children are baptized either because of, you know, somebody else did it or pressured by parents or don't even understand. And, and, and I'm here to tell you that even a, a child that does not know what it really means that Jesus was born of a virgin and what that means, you know what? They can't, they can't truly confess who Christ is if they don't understand that. You hear what I'm saying? There's got to be some understanding with this. Has one, when one is baptized to Christ, truly baptized to Christ, there's the guarantee. But it doesn't stop there. That's what I find interesting. And it takes us to our next point of our need. Who has this guarantee? Those who walk according to the Spirit. Are you still there in Romans chapter 8? And you know the first 11 verses are all about in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, those first several verses, and really carries through the context of the whole chapter, is that what you've got going on is the flesh versus the flesh. Uh, it's the spirit. The flesh versus the spirit. Just look at a couple of these passages. Uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. We know that. Uh, verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, and he will continue on, that it's always this thing... He, he, he started this way back in chapter 3. In fact, he started back in chapter 1. The problem with sin in the book of Romans. But he's carried through this whole idea, especially in 6 and 7 and 8. He's going on, and it's always about the flesh versus the spirit. So what do we need? We need to be led by the spirit. Look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. I'm going to ask you. Important question. How can we be led by the Spirit of God? Are we going to wait for God's Holy Spirit somehow to speak to us personally? Wake us up out of a good sleep and say, Brent, Brent. We know better than that. You stay in the book of Romans. What is he, what is he later going to say? He's going to say in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, all of you know this passage. I think some of the young children know this passage. In Romans 10, 17, so then faith, what? Comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, he says, for all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. How is that done through the word of God? We are influenced by God's word. And brethren, let's understand that when we are influenced by God's word and when we are walking by faith, not by sight, and walking according to the teachings of God's word, when we follow this, let me ask you, when we follow this, are we being led by the Spirit? I believe it with all my heart. And we have that as a guarantee. Not only that, the Spirit, look at verse 16, the Spirit himself. One translation says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Making the New King James a little difference. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit of God testifies with our spirit. You mean God's spirit testifies with my spirit? God's spirit bears witness with my spirit? Absolutely. God's spirit says, here's what I want you to believe. Here's what I want you to do through his word, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we, if we dismiss, if we get rid of the word of God, we'll just get rid of it. <clears throat> Can we be truly led by the Spirit apart from God's word? No way. And so God's Spirit bears witness. It testifies the saying, here's what I want you to believe. Here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to do. And you know what? How it bears witness with my spirit. My spirit can respond and say, I believe that. I've done that. And when I, when my spirit and God's spirit 
is bearing this witness one with another. And God's Spirit is testifying to me through His Word. Guess what? I know I have the guarantee. As a matter of fact, what this Spirit does is it helps in our weaknesses, that is, gives comfort, and makes intercession in our prayers. Drop on down to verses 26 through 28. So in Romans 8, likewise the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You know, when we are called by the gospel, the saving gospel of Christ, and we responded positively to that call, in our faith, our repentance, our confession, and our baptism, then we receive these promises. And the Spirit will help us. Again, it's very relational in our weaknesses. Brethren, we've got to depend upon that and not be afraid of that. Again, I'm not talking about some charismatic neo-Pentecostal movement. I'm not talking about the miraculous gifts, plural, of the Spirit that serve their purpose that are no longer. But I'm talking about what God has promised to us. He's given it to us as a guarantee. And the reason why He's made this pledge of this down payment because it gives us assurance He's going to keep his promise because you want to know something? I'm looking forward to heaven. And the Spirit is our arabone. It's God's pledge. It's his earnest towards us. It makes intercession for us in our prayers. We need to be very satisfied about that. I just want to say this. We've got to go to our last point and close. But I just want to say this. Do any of you ever feel deficient in prayer? I do. I, I really do. I feel deficient in one way. I don't think I pray as much as I should. Secondly, I feel deficient in prayer so often because there'll be thoughts on my heart and things that I know I want to express to God, but I have a difficult time in my human words trying to express to God what I want him to know what I mean. You know what I mean? Now, if you have a really good, close relationship with somebody, Vicki and I would do this all the time. We actually have a good, close relationship, by the way. And she'll be trying to express something to me. And I know what she's saying. I know where she's going. I know exactly. I mean, we've, we've, been, we've been together for 50 years. We have met each other in third grade, nine years old. Now you think about that's 50 years ago. Been married for almost 40 of those, 40 of those years that come this October. And she'll say to me, and I'll say to Vicki, I know what you mean. And she may feel that she's fumbling in her words and not expressing herself, and maybe she is. We all do, do we not? And I'll say, sweetheart, I know what you mean. I'm going to tell you, if I can do that with her, do you think that the Spirit can do that for us in communicating our prayers, our thoughts, our in, 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 in our deepest thoughts towards God? The Spirit makes intercession. That's a guarantee. I love it. Last passage. And that's Galatians chapter 5. In verse 16, he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 is going to contrast the works of the lust of the flesh with the fruit, singular, of the Spirit, which is multifaceted. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not, know, so that you do, not do the things you wish. Let me tell you right away, it's just like before. Once again, it's the flesh versus the spirit, isn't it? We know that struggle. Verse 18, but if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law, context, the old law. 
19, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, evil, uh, envy rather, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Not a comprehensive list, but it's a pretty good one. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty plain, don't you think? But look at the comparative in verse 22, the contrast. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And those who are Christ, well, how did that happen? When we heard the gospel, obeyed the gospel, baptized into Christ, we put him on, we became Child of God. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh, that is put it to death, with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I'll tell you what, the fruit of the Spirit is multifaceted again. He didn't say fruits because it is the fruit that comes from the Spirit and this is not multiple choice. I'm going to ask you, of the works of the lust of the flesh, up in those preceding verses, the verses basically, especially 19 through 21, how many of those do you have to practice and continue to be guilty of to keep you out of heaven? How many of those do you have to do? One, that's right. Somebody says, oh, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I looked at that list of a dozen sins, and you know, 11 of mine I never even think about. <laughs> but this one, no, that's, that's my thing. I'm going to tell you right now, it'll keep you out of heaven. Do we see that? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such like. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Period. But the fruit of the Spirit is. Look at it again. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against us there is no law. I mean, this is, uh, this is in, in, in Christ's system. How many of those are we to keep and practice? All of them. And that's what we're to be working upon. Now you see why the works or the lusts of the flesh is put in the plural, because one will keep you out. Whereas the fruit of the Spirit is singular, though multifaceted, which means that all need to be incorporated in our life to get you in. We've got a lot of people who don't even want to hear it that way. But that's what it is. And I love verse 25. If you live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. Don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. If you live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The only thing I can ask in conclusion is we do need to conclude, but I, the only thing I ask, and, 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 and there's a misprint on the, it says the Holt Spirit or something like that. It should be holy. But do you have the Holy Spirit as a guarantee? There it is. Truly baptized into Christ. Now living and walking in the Spirit. And when we do that, we have God's guarantee. And there's nothing better. We can help you achieve that. We extend to you the invitation. The Lord has given. Why don't you come at this time as we stand as this